Uh, today's uh, sermon is on the calling of the Apostle Peter. And if you can stand, please stand for the reading of God's Word. The title for today's sermon is Caught by Love. And the Word of God says this, beginning with verse number 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to, belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat, verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in, in the other boat to come and help them. And, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's look again at verse number one. I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, God's word says this. Uh, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Uh, Jesus had a very diverse ministry when he was here on this earth. It was diverse because he had a very special relationship with the crowds. As a matter of fact, when we look at his relationship to the crowd, we could say that his relationship with the crowd was three-dimensional. And I'm going to put these three dimensions up on the screen and we'll work through each one uh, quickly here. Uh, the first thing that we see is that Jesus, with the crowd, uh, he took the time to teach them. That's what verses 1 and 3 are all about. And think about that, that Jesus Christ would take the time to teach the people what it meant to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And, and Jesus was so practical in the way he taught the people. Like here he is, he, he, they're just crowding around him, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people, and, and he gets in a boat. So he, there's a little bit of distance between him and the people who are on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And from that distance, he can speak to them and they can see him. And, and I'm sure that, that even with the waters there, that that, that helped carry his voice and, and the, as the gospel was being proclaimed. So he, he taught the people. He also healed the people as well. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 30. Great crowds came to him bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. Imagine having an illness or a condition where doctors could, couldn't help you. Uh, medicine couldn't alleviate it. But someone brought you to Jesus, and Jesus reached out and touched you. Uh, Jesus maybe spoke words of life into you, and and you were miraculously healed. Imagine that feeling. Imagine how you would have responded to Christ in that moment. So Jesus, with the crowd, he, he taught them. He, he healed them. And we also see that he fed them as well. And we had that story in John chapter 6 where Jesus is with the 5,000 people that are there, the 5,000 men. And, and with five loaves and, and two fish, he prays over it. He thanks God for it. And then and then. He is able, God is able to multiply that bread and, and they're able to feed the 5,000 people that were gathered there that day. He, he taught them. He, he healed them. 
He fed them. And there's one word that when you read the Gospels just describes his relationship to the crowd. And it's the word compassion. When he saw the crowd, the Gospels say he had compassion on them. So what we can really say as we look at Jesus interacting with the crowd and his relationship with the crowd is this, is that at the end of the day, he did what he did because he loved them. And it was love that motivated Christ to do all that he did with the crowd. But Jesus didn't just have a unique relationship with the crowd. He also had a very special relationship with the 12, the 12 disciples. So that's what we're going to do. Starting this Sunday and for the next eight Sundays, we're going to look at Jesus' relationship to each of his 12 disciples. Now, you might think, wait a second, there's 12 disciples, but you're going to spend eight weeks on that? But that doesn't add up. Shouldn't it be 12 weeks? Well, the truth is there's, there's a handful of disciples that the Bible doesn't really say that much about them. So we're just going to kind of maybe lump those together and then we'll, we'll spend uh, as much time as the Bible spends on each of those disciples. Before we go any further, I did want to say that when we look as we, as we begin to talk about the relationship that Jesus Christ had with his disciples, I want all of us to understand that Jesus hand-picked his disciples. Look at what the Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus speaking to the 12. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And this principle of Jesus hand-selecting his 12 is true from Peter all the way to Judas. So it's important for us to understand as we begin to look at uh, this, this sermon series of the calling of the 12. Now, we're going to begin with Peter, okay? So it, it, Peter was quite the character. If you look at his life and, and his interaction with, for the three years that he had with Jesus, we, we could probably say that Peter was a very um, stubborn person. He was very uh, hard-headed. How do we say in Spanish? Cabezadura. And, and, and he was very hot-tempered. He was very impulsive. And, and many times he did things because he was scared to death and he didn't know what else to do. Well, as I looked at his life and as I studied through his life this week, I, I see that Peter had many false starts. Uh, his life was full of what I'm calling epic fails. Let's look at a few of them. Let's begin with this one. Remember that day that, that Jesus is walking on water and he's going out to the disciples. And the disciples are scared because they think it's a ghost. But then they realize that it's actually Jesus. And so when, Jesus, when Peter sees that it's Jesus walking towards the boat, Peter asks Jesus, can I come out and walk towards you? And Jesus grants him permission. And, and there Peter goes. He's, he's, and by the way, he's the only one that had the courage to get out of the boat. The other, the other 11 were still in the boat. He gets out and he begins to walk towards Jesus. And as he's inching his way closer and closer to Jesus, what happened? The winds and the waves started picking up, and Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, and he puts his eyes on the storm. And then what happened to him? He began to what? He began to sink. And then he had to call out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus, in his grace, reaches out and pulls Peter out, and he puts him back in the boat. Epic fail number one. Here's another one. Uh, Peter comes to Jesus and he's got a very important question for Jesus. Because I, I think somebody had maybe done something to offend Peter. And Peter's thinking like, okay, I got to forgive this person. Uh, this person, but this is not the first time this person has done this to me. So let me go and ask Jesus. Jesus, how many times should we forgive someone who's done something wrong to us? Lord, seven times? Is that, is that good? If I, we just forgive him seven times? And Jesus turns to Peter and says, no, not, not seven times, 70 times seven. Peter, I want you to forgive people as often as God has forgiven you. Then there's that time that Jesus invites Peter, James, and John to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And what a beautiful moment and the midway point of the ministry of Jesus Christ where he reveals his glory. 
and he's up on this mountain. He's revealing his glory, and Moses and Elijah are up there as well. I mean, it's a, it's a, we could say it's an epic moment. It was amazing, and, and Peter's there watching the whole thing, and he says this to Jesus. He interrupts the whole thing that's going on, and he says, uh, Lord, would you like for me to set up three shelters here? Then the Bible says that he said that because he didn't know what to say. He was scared to death. He totally ruined the moment with Christ at that moment. What about the time that Jesus takes, pulls his disciples aside and he reveals to them his plan to save the world and how this plan included him dying on a cross. But that three days later, he would rise from the grave. And when Peter heard that story, he didn't like that story. The Bible says he took, pulled Jesus aside and he said, that, the Bible says that he rebuked the Lord and said, we're never going to let that happen to you. Could you imagine someone pulling Jesus aside and telling Jesus what Jesus needs to do to get it right? I'm sure that's never happened to anybody here. By the way, we should be seeing ourselves in each one of these stories, okay? Then there was the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed. And before he took the bread, the Bible says that he took a towel and he wraps it around his waist. And he began to wash the feet of his disciples. Just Jesus humbling himself, showing that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And as he begins to wash the feet of his disciples, he gets to Peter. And when Peter sees Jesus with a towel around his waist and in his hands, he's like, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. No way. And Jesus said to Peter, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. And when Peter heard that, he's like, well, in that case, Lord, don't just stop with my feet. Wash my whole body because I want to have every part of you. And Jesus was like, I could just see Jesus smiling. <laughs> and he's like, Peter, listen, those who have already had their bodies washed only need to wash their feet. You only need, you only need to get saved once. But every day you need to wash your feet before God. Then after that dinner, Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John, and, and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus offers one of the most memorable prayers in all of Scripture. He says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And Peter totally missed it. He never heard that prayer. The reason why Peter never heard that prayer is because Peter was snoring. He was sleeping. Three times Jesus had to go to Peter and say, wake up. And then he says this, could you not keep watch with me for one hour? And then the soldiers come. And they're coming to arrest Jesus Christ. And there's that exchange between Jesus and, and Judas. And, and one of the soldiers goes and takes hold of Jesus to take him to the house of the high priest. And as soon as that, that soldier named Malchus grabs uh, Jesus... The Bible says Peter pulled out a sword and he went to kill the man. Now, I don't know how it happened to chop off somebody's ear. I don't know if the dude went like this and when he swung or if he just went like that and he missed, chopped the guy's ear off. The ear's on the floor. Jesus looks to Peter and he says to Peter, put your sword away, put it back where it's supposed to go. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. I'm sure Peter was like, I thought I was doing the right thing. I, I got this one wrong too. So they cart Jesus away to the high priest to stand trial. The Bible says that all the disciples scattered except two, John and Peter. They follow Jesus. Peter positions, I think if we hear the story right, I think John gives Peter entrance into the, the courtroom, the courtyard. Peter's actually close enough to G see Jesus stand trial. Just kind of think of it being here and just outside that window. And as Peter's watching what's taking place, somebody comes up to Peter and says, hey, wait a second. Aren't you one of the 12 
disciples that followed Jesus? And Peter was like, no, that's, I don't know what you're talking about. And then somebody else came. And then somebody else came. And he denied Jesus three times. And after he denied the Lord three times, the Bible says the rooster crowed. And when the rooster crowed, the Bible says Jesus looked at him. And they both made eye contact. And Peter was so overwhelmed with guilt. And I'm not going to make, I'm going to make the story that's really long. I'm going to make it really short. That he ends up going back. He ends up going back fishing. He goes back to the place where he was before Jesus Christ called him to follow him. Now, we could keep going on. Let me tell you, we could keep going on. We could go to, we could go to the book of Acts. We could go to the book of Galatians. When, when God told Peter, get up and eat this food, and Peter was like, I'm not eating that food. God says, you're going to eat the food I'm telling you to eat. That there's that time when the apostle Paul actually has to confront the apostle Peter because he had allowed himself to be influenced by Jewish opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you look at this man's life, it is filled with false starts. It is filled with epic fails. It's filled with him falling flat on his face over and over and over again. And I got to tell you, I love it. I love it. Not because I want to see somebody fail, but because I see myself in that man's life. We fail. Every day we fail. So if Peter ever gets it right in the Gospels, we know he doesn't get any credit for that. It's because it's God working in his life to get him to say the right thing, to get him to do the right thing. God gets all the glory when Peter gets it right. I don't know about you, but I want to live my life that way. If I ever get it right, I want God to get all the glory. Amen? I want to give praise to Jesus right now because let me tell you something. That's the God that we serve. The one that doesn't give up on us. The one who continues to reach out to save us. There were times when Peter got it right. But let me tell you something. Peter, Peter's the real thing. He was a real man that needed a real savior. A real savior not just to save him, right, because Jesus came to save us, but to sustain him as well. Not just to bring him to the cross, but to lead him from the cross to, to the promised land as well. There were a few times when Peter got it right. But God gets the credit every time Peter gets it right. There's this one time Jesus is with his disciples. And he asked this question to his disciples. Who do men say that I am? And the disciples thought about it for a moment. And they said, well, uh, some people say you're, you're John the Baptist. Come back from the dead. Other people say you're, you're the prophet Elijah. Others say you are one of the prophets. And Jesus said, okay, that's good. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter was the first one to pipe up. And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded by saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And so Peter, when he gets it right, it's because God is getting it right for him. Let's jump back in the story here in, in Luke chapter 5. After Jesus is done teaching, he looks to Peter in verse number 4, and he says to Peter in verse number 4, let's go fishing. But what's the problem? According to verse number 5, the disciples had been fishing the whole night. Peter had already been fishing the entire night, and he hadn't caught anything. But look at what he says to Jesus in verse 5. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Look at the trust. Look at the obedience. Look at the faith. That even when it didn't make sense, mathematically, chronologically, logically, whatever you want to say. It didn't make sense for him to let down the nets, but Jesus told him to let down the nets, and that was good enough for him to obey the Lord. And then what happened when they let down the nets in verse number 6? What happened? They caught what? So many fish. That what happened to the net? The net started to break, and Peter starts to panic. 
We're about to lose the biggest catch of our lives out here. And he calls James and John, who are in the other boat. He says, guys, come over here. You guys got to come help me quick before we lose all these fish. And they come, and they bring their boat. And so together, they, Andrew and Peter on one side, James and John on the other side, they're trying to bring in all these fish into the boat. And what begins to happen to the boat at the end of verse number 7? What happens to the boat? The boat begins to... Sink, you know it's a miracle. You know it's a miracle because the boats weren't prepared to withstand the weight of these fish. And in that very moment, when Peter, when Peter realizes what's really taking place here, that Jesus is revealing his glory to them. Jesus is letting them know that he's the Messiah. He's the almighty son of God. And when Peter realizes that he's in the presence of the Son of God, look at how he responds. In verse number 8, he says this to Jesus. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Why would Peter say that? Because Peter knew he was a broken man. He knew that he was a sinful man. Peter knew that there's no fellowship with light and darkness. Between clean and unclean. Between holy and unholy. He knew he did not deserve. He did not merit. He did not earn the right or deserve the right to be in the presence of the God's holy son. So he asked Jesus to leave him. But look at the grace that Jesus Christ extends to Peter in verse number 10. He says at the end of verse number 10, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, I'm going to leave. But I'm taking you with me. And I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. And that's exactly what Jesus did for Peter for the next three years. Through his life, through all the things that, Jesus, that Peter witnessed Jesus do with the crowd. Teach them, heal them, feed them. Peter learned how to fish for people. And we know Peter learned how to fish for people because all you have to do is take your Bible and go to Acts chapter 2. And on that day of Pentecost, when the Bible says that the room was filled with God-fearing people from every nation under the sun... And all of a sudden, the, the, the Holy Spirit showed up in the form of a mighty rushing wind. And some crazy things started happening. I mean, tongues of fire started appearing on top of people's heads. People began to speak in languages and be understood in languages that they had never spoken before. And so everybody's confused. What is happening here? And, and what, what, how do we make sense of what's happening here? And then Peter takes God's word and he stands right in the center of the crowd. And he begins to preach about who Jesus Christ is and why Jesus Christ came and why Jesus Christ had to die. And even though you put him to death, God raised him so that he could be our Savior, so he could be our Messiah, so that he could be our Savior and friend. And it was such a powerful and such a moving sermon that the Bible says this in the next slide, that the people asked Peter, when, listen to this, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. It, it, it brought them to their knees, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And the response of Peter was, Repent. Turn to God and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that day, do you know, do you, do anybody know how many people gave their life to Jesus Christ that day? The Bible says 3,000 people surrendered their life to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And since that day, the church of Jesus Christ has never stopped growing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Peter goes on to have a powerful ministry in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, the first part of the book of Acts is dedicated to Peter's ministry in the early church. Peter goes on to write two more books in the Bible, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And actually, there's a couple of verses from 1 Peter I want to share with you that I think can kind of bring everything full circle. The first one is this. 
Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, when he was talking about how the people of God were redeemed by Jesus Christ. He said, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You have to understand, Jesus knew all the blemishes and all the defects in the life of Peter. He spent three years with him. Spend three years with anybody, and you'll know all their personality. You know their quirks. You know their shortcomings. You want to know mine? Just ask my wife and my children. They're going to tell you, okay? Don't ask my mom because she thinks I'm the greatest thing uh, that was ever born. But ask anybody else. They'll tell you that this is, this is who he is. This is all the bad stuff he's ever done. <laughs> but just like Peter... Just like Jesus knew Peter, Peter knew Jesus. Peter spent three years with Jesus. Peter saw Jesus interact with the crowds, with the Pharisees, with the prostitutes, with the tax collectors, with the sinners, with those who had been pushed aside by society. He saw how Jesus loved those people. And at the end of three years... He says this. He testifies these words about our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says he was perfect. He was perfect. And the perfect Son of God gave his life for us. And he goes on to say this. This is the other verse when I was reading 1 Peter that grabbed a hold of me to bring it first full circle. He encourages the believers in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. That man who wrote those words was speaking from experience because he had experienced the forgiving love of Jesus Christ who covered over all of his false starts. All of his epic fails. And Jesus still loved that man. Jesus still died on the cross for that man. And that man that had received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ was now encouraging believers to you too. The man who had a question about how many times should we forgive somebody when they do us wrong. This man was now testifying. You cover over other people's faults as many times as God has forgiven you and covered over your fault. You see, when we get to the point in our lives where we understand that when we get it wrong, it's our fault. We take the blame from it. Don't put that blame on anybody else. You take the blame for it. When we get it wrong, it's our fault. But if there's ever a time that we get it right, he gets the glory. And when we live that way, let me tell you what happens. The Spirit moves us from our sin. And he moves us to faith in Jesus Christ. And when he moves us to faith in Jesus Christ, then he moves us to a life of service, of following our Lord and Savior wherever he leads us. Let's bow in prayer.